On November 8, 2018, the most deadly wildfire in California's recorded history started in the area of Paradise, California. The town had a population of 27,000 and was virtually wiped off the face of the earth in eight hours. The fire destroyed over 18,000 structures, including 14,000 homes. 85 people perished, along with an estimated 6,000 to 15,000 pets, defined as cats, dogs, horses, and domesticated farm animals. The smoke drifted well over 200 miles south, depositing a layer of ash and soot on the San Francisco Bay Area and delivered a threat to respiratory health. So the question is, what have we learned from the Paradise Fire and are we prepared to take action to prevent this level of destruction in the future? When a structure burns, uh, propane tanks can go up, a car tires can burn, the paint on the house is now turned into dust, etc. The retardants that are being used, those go into the watershed. My name is Jim Connor. Welcome to Game Changers Silicon Valley. My guests are Bo Rogers, president of Elchera X, a company focused on the early detection of wildfires, and Seth Shalette, CEO of the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council. Let's join the conversation with Bo and Seth about the efforts underway to address the growing frequency of wildfires. So Bo, you're a longtime entrepreneur here in Silicon Valley, well-known guy, done a number of startups, and you um, appears found a, quite a winner here. I'll ask you to give us a little bit of an overview of the technology and, how, and what you think the, the prospects of this uh, technology are for changing the game in addressing wildfires. Sure, uh, and Jim, thank you for having me. Uh, the key to fire can be summed in two words. One, one is mitigation. That is the front end of the fire, what happens prior to or exactly at. And the next comment is suppression. And those are the, been the ways we've normally managed it. In the old days, there were fire towers where a human being was actually in a tower. Today, Alchera and Fire Scout has created a virtual fire tower. We have taken away the need for the human being, and now with cameras that are dispersed around the state and around the country, we're able through software and an API to easily plug in and allow that CCTV operator, the manned operator, to no longer be needed. We do a better job of spotting fire. We do a better job of alerting. So on the mitigation side, technology is starting to play a role to really help there. On the suppression side, it's always been a challenge. I call it more muscle and more steel. It's simply a response. Uh, these bigger fires need bore more borate bombers. They need more toxic chemicals. They need more manpower. In our opinion, technology's got to come into this. It's a death spiral to just think you're going to out manpower this situation. So back to technology, we're on the front end, the mitigation. And there's also other services like satellite that are viewing down and taking a look at situational awareness. The once the fire's underway, what are those fire lines and how is this going to go so you can begin to manage this better. Mm -hmm. But that's a quick look at how technology is playing a role in fighting wildfire. Seth, I'd like you to give us an overview of the, the, the increasing occurrence of wildfires. When did this frequency take off? Has it been a long-term trend or a short-term trend? It's a long-term trend, but it's been accelerated and exacerbated in part by climate change. Uh, climate change has significant impacts across the whole forest ecosystem that lead to um, greater frequency of wildfires and, as important, greater severity when fires happen. So over the last 10 to 20 years, we've seen a pretty significant increase. In fact, if you look at the 20 largest wildfires in California, and this is data that Cal Fire keeps, of the 20 largest by acres, 11 of the 20 happened from 2017 through last year. What are the underlying causes? I, I, I want to get to that because there's quite a debate about what are the causes of wildfire of wildfires. Well, that's one of the things that makes it such a complex issue because there's not one single silver bullet. Uh, climate change leads to drying out of what's known as the fuels, the vegetation. When fuels lose their moisture and they can't retain water, uh, they become tinder boxes. Um, also, we see here in California a lot of tree mortality uh, through um, disease. Um, and frankly, 
The biggest challenge is we're seeing a warming climate, and that leads to more what's known as fire weather days. You may know the term red flag days, Mm -hmm. and the number of red flag incidences has increased quite a bit over the last number of years. So the company is Alchera X, and the product is Fire Scout. Correct. Okay. And as I understand now, on the mitigation side, you're using cameras that are already installed. Is that correct? Correct. And then you put software in them that's got some degree of artificial intelligence that pinpoints the beginning of what is maybe a fire. Is that correct? Well, yes, you're pretty close. So let's go back. Um, the utilities trying to make sure they got as many eyes on the cameras or on the uh, view sheds, potential fire areas, uh, went ahead and supported and purchased putting up fire stations. They looked at different mountains with good view sheds into areas. They looked at dispersing those. They paid for those cameras. They're called access cameras in this case, and they have an X or horizontal, they have a Y or V vertical, and then they have a zoom, the ability pan, tilt, zoom to locate. So once that's set up, those were manned by human beings. So there was a media wall, and that group of people would view them at 24 hours a day. Tiring, humans make mistakes. Uh, If there's fog or other kind of anomalies, it's not picked up. Our company uses software and millions of impressions which we've looked at to absolutely separate smog from folk, from smoke, from steam, from geysers up in Geyserville, and can quickly put a box around and spot that, and then deliver that information and sign an alert. So the human being there does not have to be actively there until they see an alert, can quickly spot the camera and then locate it to a latitude and longitude, which is the key information to send resources out. They now know where to go, how far away it is, and what the situation is. It's all done with AI technology, no humans necessary, and you run 24-7, correct? The identification and the notification is correct, yes. Uh, Is there a difference between daytime and nighttime because you can't see smoke? Correct. So in the daytime, it is a normal visual situation. At nighttime, the access cameras are IR capability, infrared capability. And so from that, we have a different algorithm. The daytime algorithm looks for anomalies in the micropixels that look like smoke. They go through all of the images in milliseconds and say, yes, that is in fact smoke. It's not steam, it's not fog, it's not a geyser, and quickly send that alert. At night, as soon as we see a spark or we see a flame from a standpoint of IR, the algorithm evaluates that against millions of impressions and says, yes, that's not a light at an airport. It's not a headlight coming down the road. That, in fact, is spark or flame. Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, I've got to ask you one more, only because you got my, you piqued my interest. Good. Then what happens? Then what happens? Where do the alarms go off? Do you call the fire department? I mean, there's got to be multiple jurisdictions covering these woods. You have a map and say, oh, it's here, therefore this is Sonoma County, it's here, this is some other county. Good. So so go back to that grid I mentioned of the cameras that are located, whether it's in Sonoma County or whatever. It is a pg and asset. It is out covering those areas. There is a collaboration between the utility and the local area. Let's pick Sonoma. And they have an emergency management uh, group there that then works with a group called REDCOM. REDCOM is a fire and emergency dispatch center. They have trained people, they have a media wall, and our alerts go right to them. There is a box that surrounds that smoke. There is an alarm that shows bong, bong, bong. This is an issue. The person's attention is drawn to it. They can look at the camera. There is metadata that shows where in that image it is, how far away it is, what the latitude and longitude is, and which we're getting really much better at. And now they have data to send to the fire department, to the sheriff's department, to the first responders that can get on it. They now know where it is and what time it is. To your point, jurisdictionally, that is important. Maybe more in Southern California, where it's a more densely packed area, but in Northern California too, it could be in Napa County, it could be in Sonoma or Mendocino, all bordering counties in the wine country. So we try to provide that data as well. Very good, and I just want to ask one last one. Is this a, the uh, analogous to a 911 phone number, but for fires? It is, and our, our, actually our battle is to beat 911 calls for the simple reason that many good citizens see some smoke, 
They are excited. They call 911 and the questioner says, well, where is it? The person doesn't have the geographic reference and said, well, it's on a tall hill or a mountain. It's over to my left, which is not highly helpful information to dispatch. But at least we're after trying to beat 911 calls, and we have in many cases. Okay. So I'm going to come back to you, Seth, because you're at this Fire Safe Council for the county. Correct. What is What is your... Um, Mission, purpose, jurisdiction, what, what can you do, what's outside of your legal or your designated mission? Sure, well, good. Well, thank you. First, um, our, our mission is to mobilize and keep the people of Santa Clara County safe. And our area that we serve is principally Santa Clara County and what's known as the Wildland Urban Interface. The acronym is WUI. You hear that term a lot. And so we serve the WUI areas, which, if you think about it, is really where development and the vegetation and the forested areas meet. That's kind of the interface point where development meets the woods. That's kind of how I like to think about it. And those areas tend to be the high risk areas in Santa Clara County. So we work collaboratively with all of the agencies in Santa Clara County, CAL FIRE, Santa Clara County FIRE, Office of Emergency Management, and all the entities to do a number of things. Um, we have a hazardous fuels reduction practice uh, where we have done some of the largest, what are known as fuel breaks and shaded fuel breaks, where we mitigate and minimize the vegetation and reduce the risk of a wildfire, and where we also allow greater access for the emergency response personnel. We also work very closely with CAL FIRE and County FIRE to create escape routes so that if you have to get out, and we've all seen on TV uh, pictures of people trying to get out where it's just a wall of fire all around them, we want to eliminate that situation and allow for safe and fast access. We also have a number of other programs, including what's known as the Forest Health Grant. We have a collaborative with um, San Jose Water, with uh, MidPen, and Santa Clara County Parks, where we're treating about 955 acres in the Los Gatos Creek watershed with both forest health and wildfire mitigation projects. What's the biggest risk right now within these communities, Santa Clara? Is it uh, overgrown bush trees, wood? stuff that's uh, rotting and getting dried out? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, you know, the risks have really multiplied um, over the last couple of years, partly because there's a vegetation overgrowth. Um, there's just a lot of non-native species and a lot of vegetation that creates a significant risk. But Jim, if you ask me what the biggest risk is and where we can have the most impact, it's in people becoming engaged and taking responsibility for their own defensible space, right? There is a zone of risk around an individual house. And if you are proactive in vegetation management and taking care of your, vet, your defensible space, then you are more likely to reduce the risk of a wildfire. And the biggest challenge in any wildfire is embers, right? The sparks that spread, they get carried away. If they land on a roof, if they land on a house, if they get into your eaves, you can have an ignition. And that's one of the biggest risks, and trying to reduce the ability to do that is where we get involved in. Right. So, Bo, I, um, in speaking to you before this, you were giving me literally an education about the destruction of wildfires. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain to our audience, and I'm happy to listen again to the immense destruction that you were able to document in, this is say, the last 10 or 12 wildfires in the aggregate. Sure, and, and Seth and I were talking about that beforehand, and it is not myopic, but many people think in terms of a wildfire, and that's trees, vegetation, um, structures, etc. They burn down. And then as we used to go over the hill to Santa Cruz after a good rain, you'd see the grass grow up, and people would pretty much say, okay, yeah. that fire's gone, we're, we're out of the woods, part of the pun. <laughs> the reality is there are some very powerful lingering effects from a major fire. One of those powerful lingering effects is what's called the burn scar. And you can imagine, because you've seen hillsides with big rivulets cut into them, because there was no weeds, no shrubbery, nothing to block the water tumbling down that hill or that mountain. A, a terrible example is down in Montecito, California, where there was a major fire and then they had an atmospheric river about two to three months later, and boulders the size of Volkswagens crushed 24 people in their homes in Montecito, a very fashionable, you know, residential area. And who'd have thought that this could happen in this day and age? So burn scars 
are one of the real tragedies, and they stay there. Is that because the boulders were no longer supported by the roots and so on like that? The roots, et cetera, and there was nothing to block them. Once they started moving, there was no grass, no roots, no trees to block their roll. They went tumbling on down and literally got almost down to Highway 101. The, the next powerful ingredient that most people don't think about is that when a structure burns, uh, propane tanks can go up, a car tires can burn, the paint on the house is now turned into dust, et cetera. The retardants that are being used, I see even lawsuits sometimes on the retardants that are hurting you know, fire people, et cetera. Those go into the watershed. They actually get washed down, get into a stream, into a creek, out to a lake. And aside from killing the water uh, life, et cetera, that has to be filtered out to be treatable and used by human beings. So not only is the devastation from the fire itself and the immediacy, there are powerful lingering impacts from burn scars and from toxic chemicals. And, and then all these homes and structures destroyed too. This has got to be a huge amount of damage. The damage is obviously terrible, and for those people that want to go off into the woods, et cetera, and I have had a home in the mountains, it is from kind of May till you see the first snowflake falling, it is a worrisome situation to say, is a cigarette going to get tossed out? Is somebody trailing a boat and the chain sparks on the ground and hits a dry spark and gets that going? Are there other things? A chainsaw might hit its spark. Are there arsonists, which there are? So yes, it's a very worrisome thing. So before we start, we had a little chat, just getting to know each other a little bit, and I ask you, how do fires start? I mean, I read this article, I think you told me that a catalytic converter going over tall weeds and dry grass could mm -hmm. actually spark a fire or create a, a fire. And of course, you explained to me earlier about how cables age or there's an ulcer, the weakening, and sparks come from electrical power lines too. Maybe you can go back, give us an overview. I'll do that, but I'd like uh, to also yeah. defer to, to Seth from a standpoint of what or the re what causes fire, you know, so sure. we'll collaborate on that because he's got a good piece there. I got to be very genuine here. If a fire is caused by a, a utility or there have been examples of the situation, obviously the maintenance of that equipment is challenging. And on the other side, I'm a, a user of the utilities. We need the power. Uh, hospitals need to run on the power. We can't say, oh, them. They're trying to do their job to deliver power. As people move more and more out into rural areas because they want to get away from this, you have to take power out there, and that puts it in harm's way by infiltrating into a more wooded area. So one of the things that happens is uh, nature takes its course on a lot of the physical utilities, just from a standpoint of age, uh, the ability to get resources to take care of it. So I'll leave it at that, but that's something that I think the utilities really have gotten the message. They understand the importance of being good citizens, and I think they're doing a, a, a much better job at really trying to mitigate that part as well. Did you want to comment, Seth, about Yeah, that? no, I think Bo is spot on, and I think what's interesting, and most people might find this surprising when you first hear it, is in California, 90 to 93% of all wildfires are human caused. 90 to 95%? Yeah, 90 to 95%. Uh -huh. um, and nationally, it's a little less, maybe around 85%, but the vast majority of wildfires are human caused. Then here in California, we have some sporadic issues with lightning induced wildfires, both lightning and what's known as dry lightning when there's no moisture. The challenge with lightning fires is they tend to be, they tend to burn larger acres because they often happen in more remote parts of the area. And so a lightning strike can have a faster spread, although not always, but yeah, most of the um, wildfires are, are human caused and hence we have control or have the ability to have a greater influence of tamping that down. So Bo, now I, I've got this image. Your camera's up and running, it's uh, daytime and some, suddenly there's smoke and it's way out there, way out there in a the distant area. How fast is your system? Your system can pick this up pretty quick, I think. And then how long does it take to get a crew or somebody to respond to it? So you're right. And there are some, you know, physical issues. If there's fog coming through, if it's getting later at night, you talked about ambient noise here a second ago, ambient light, et cetera. But we're very good, you know, in the five, 10 kilometer range, et cetera. 
as you get out in distance, you also have uh, valleys and peaks. So beyond that ridge line, you may not be able to see down in there. You can see the smoke. The one thing we are very good at, though, is spotting smoke. And I know you'll put this image up to show the people. We put a box around that image, and we've seen it in many, many ambient light situations. Now on that camera, as I said, there's an x-axis, horizontal, moves right to left, a y-axis moves mm -hmm. vertically, and then there's also the zoom. So you have the ability, once that camera is set, mm -hmm. to see left to right geographically where that is on a compass bearing, get a pretty good line out to that. Many people also triangulate. Once they see the fire there, they'll pull sight from another camera to triangulate to really get that latitude and longitude to a much more precise level. Those are the credentials, those are the that's the information the fire responding teams wanna know. How big is it? What are the fuel sources out there? And I'm going sideways, but it's a key point. Is it grass? That means fire is gonna go fast. Is it heavily wooded? That means fire is gonna be very hot. Are there structures out there? That means possible propane tank explosions, chemicals. All of this is important information for the responders to say, how do I arm myself to go out and deal with this? So in quick summary, we give a good latitude and longitude. Triangulation refines that. We give a compass bearing, and now we're getting much more capable at getting them, uh, the fire responders, to a, a location they can say, I know where it is, it's on Fish Ranch Road, and we're on it. Mm -hmm. So, Seth, what level of risk do we run here in Santa Clara County relative to the events that Bo's described? And, uh, you know, the Paradise Fire and some of the other fires, there's one in Merced right now, and there's one down in the Monterey, I noticed. I looked last night on the N NASA map. Fires. Big Sur has that. Big Sur, them. yeah. Sure. And look, we run a significant risk. I mean, most people might think, well, Santa Clara Carry County, that's Silicon Valley. But the reality is Santa Clara County is very mixed. If you go south, San Martin, Gilroy, that area, it's still very agricultural. Significant risks. But even in the areas of Los Gatos, uh, even in the areas of uh, Saratoga, where our office is based, there are significant risks for wildfire. Most people don't realize that. In fact, my agency, the Santa Clara County Fire Safe Council, is leading what's known as the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Uh, we are leading the update of that plan. We've just started with all of the county agencies and all the county partners. It's really the county blueprint, the document for wildfire mitigation. It was last updated by us and our partners in 2016. But Jim, to your point, since 2016, we've had the CZU fires that impacted Santa Clara County. We had the LNU complex fires. So we have significant risk uh, of, of fire in Santa Clara County. And our role is to work with partners like Alchera X and Bo to help bring solutions to the table and allow our partners to adopt these technologies. So Bo, are you out there in many, many counties, uh, 10, 20 counties? And are you outside of California? Yes, yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> Without being a wise guy, uh, <laughs> Pacific Gas and Electric uh, has been a very proud uh, customer of ours. We are on uh, well over 300 cameras. That means our software is on the cameras, we're monitoring the view sheds, and we're sending alerts and datas to people monitoring those media centers. Mm -hmm. So that's happening. Uh, we got our start uh, actually in Sonoma County, and obviously with the major fires that impacted wineries, and obviously the fires that we had, they had up there. They've got a FEMA grant. We were brought in. We were selected as being 40% better than our competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we are right now. We're working in Southern California, another big utility, San Diego Gas and Electric. And to your question, outside of California, we're working with NV Energy. That's Nevada Energy, a Berkshire Hathaway company, and so we're outside of California in Nevada as well. And the reason is getting down to it without being self-serving, we've seen more images, we're on more cameras, and we've had more actual situations, and just experience is a key factor in getting better at this. Very good. Well, uh, Seth, let me uh, ask you, I'll start with you, to give a, our audience a way to follow up with you. And what is uh, what should they follow up with you about? What is the most ideal information you would connect with uh, people well, in the audience? I would encourage all the listeners to visit our website, uh, which is uh, sccfiresafe.org. That's sccfiresafe.org. 
you'll find a plethora of information on how to manage your own defensible space, what that means, steps that you can take. You'll find the most recent community wildfire protection program, and you'll find a lot of information on our projects, the escape routes, the fuel breaks, where we are and where we're going. Very good. And Bo, if you've got uh, potential um, engagements in the audience listening to you, whether it's a, a, a government agency or a utility, how would they follow up with you? And that would be uh, contact Bo, B-O-W, at Alchera, Inc., A-L-C-H-E-R-A, Inc., dot com. Okay, and the website is Alchera, Inc. It is Alchera. No, it's firescout.ai. Oh, firescout.ai. Firescout.ai. Okay. Well, look, I want to thank both of you. You've been very informative. I've learned quite a bit here. I had no idea that the fires were so devastating. I've had a chance to talk to you ahead of time. But it's remarkable what's going on. So I um, I want to thank you for coming in today, and I want to wish each of you every success going forward. Thank you, Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Our pleasure. Appreciate the opportunity. Hope we can help. Thanks for joining us in this show. I now have a new awareness and appreciation of the destructive intensity of wildfires. There is much we can do from reporting the early signs of our of a wildfire as well as our personal responsibility to reduce the materials and products that can feed a wildfire you can find more information on both organizations as well as the complete library of all shows at our website gamechangers.tv we look forward to your continued engagement with upcoming shows